thank you so much to everyone who's here and a special thanks to Albert and team for organizing this conference. My name is Reginald Oduor, Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Nairobi, and it is a joy to be here. I think I'll do a bit of reading of uh, my introduction, but I also want to, to be very conscious about time. And um, the view in a sizable number of traditional societies is evidently anthropocentric, expressing itself in the conviction that the value of the human person infinitely surpasses that of all other beings on earth. Thus, Judeo-Christianity's assertion that humans are made in the image of God, the centrality of humans in the African ontological hierarchy of Placid Temples and John Beatty after him, and Aristotle's Descartes, Descartes and Kant's view of reason as a distinguishing feature of the human person are all testimony to this. Even the Darwinian view of the human species as the most evolved and therefore the most dominant on the planet seems to somehow bear witness to this. However, with the, uh, with the rapid rise of contemporary conservationism, this view is now widely considered to be untenable as humans are now considered to be the almost exclusive cause of rampant environmental degradation. In addition, transhumanism and posthumanism now challenge traditional conceptions of the essence of the bio biological, physiological, and psychological makeup of the human person. Consequently, drawing from conceptions of the human person among the Luo of Kenya, this paper seeks to answer the following three questions. One, must we choose between environmental conservation and the upholding of the infinite dignity of the human person? Two, how human is the current largely monopolar discourse on environmental conservation? And three, is it conceptually possible to reconfigure humanity and the non-human from an African perspective, or do such efforts merely constitute a conceptual imposition from corporatized Western environmentalism, transhumanism, and posthumanism? Those then are my questions. And uh, if I was to do this in a long way, I have an outline here, which I shall largely contravene, an introduction, then, uh, then there's a discussion on environmental conservation and or upholding the dignity of the human person. In this first section, first section, I was, um, I, I wanted to talk about the fact that we have been presented with a supposed binary, that if we are to conserve the environment, we must abandon anthropocentrism. And my question is, are those the only two options? Isn't that rather doctrinaire? And on what basis is this binary created? But the second um, main section ha has to do with the inhumanity of the current monopolar discourse on environmental conservation, by which I mean, now it is assumed, a lot of, uh, um, of discourses start as follows. The earth has been greatly degraded. We must act first to reverse the situation. Therefore, we must abandon anthropocentrism. Uh, and again, I ask, oh, really? And the third part of my paper, the human and the non-human, uh, a, a Kenyan Luo perspective, is where I draw from my own heritage as a Luo grounded in my culture to interrogate this contemporary discourse before I draw some conclusions. However, in the interest of time, I will pass a lot of, uh, uh, I will jump over a lot of this, uh, my, 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 uh, my slides and go to this one, anti-imperialist challenges to the dominant conservationist discourse. The conservationist discourse 
does not address the need for redistribution to tackle gross wealth inequalities, yet conditions of abject poverty degrade the environment. We hear a lot of the United Nations talking about, oh, we must change our lifestyle and so on. Yes, there, is, there are the uh, sustainable development goals, but in view of the endeavor to abandon anthropocentrism, the issue of abject poverty, I don't think is being adequately addressed. The second point here is according to the 2023 um, Oxfam report, according to the 2023 Oxfam report, the richest 1% grabbed nearly two thirds of all new wealth worth $42 trillion created since 2020 almost twice as much money as the bottom 99% of the world's population. These are the same people who fund environmental conservation ventures, but do not address this redistribution. I have a problem with that. Um, and then you can see a bit of a mistake there with my... Um, an error with my slides. I do these slides by ear, I'm totally blind. And somehow at that point, there was a, a bit of a mess. But then you go to the next point that critics cite the idea of going slow in the use of natural resources, inherent in the ideal of sustainable development as nothing but an ingenious strategy to maintain Western hegemony of a third world economies in order to sustain their ever increasing appetite for cheap raw materials. I think the idea of carbon credits, for example, and telling us in the third world to really grow forests while the West continues to enjoy its um, consumerist lifestyle is a problem. And um, then comes the so-called One Health, the so-called One Health approach, which advocates for the treating of the health of human beings, animals, plants, and ecosystems on an equal footing, devalues human life and threatens to overshadow and distort most, if not all, other discourses. Clearly, what I'm saying here, uh, considering a lot of what has been said, is in context controversial. But when I was being trained in philosophy, I was taught that the philosopher finds problems where others find none. So I'd like to highlight two of the forerunners of the current dominant conservationist discourse, one being the neo-Darwinist neo-Darwinism, which comprises cosmic evolution, chemical evolution, biological evolution, geological evolution, social evolution, and conscious evolution. Time fails me to go into that, but that's been a dominant um, influence uh, in bringing to birth the current discourse. And the second um, forerunner that I would like to highlight is Garrett Hardin's infamous lifeboat ethics, the case against helping the poor, which lumps all the blame, or at least most of it, on the poor for environmental degradation. And those of you who know that essay, he says, let natural um, forces deal with the poor. They overbreed anyway. They consume resources. They, they, they just are a mess. And let them alone. Don't take food to them through food aid. And don't bring them to the food by allowing them to emigrate to the West. Now, in the interest of time, then, I do not wish to go into detail to my second section, but, I, but simply to say that the current discourse is, in my view, monopolar. Because what it does is to highlight the United Nations line. Oh, we are perishing. We must do drastic things sustainable development, but uh, environment almost before humans. But those who question are not given space to do so. 
And I'm thinking, for example, of Patrick Moore, Patrick Moore founder of um, Greenpeace, who later said, hey, you know what? Um, things are being exaggerated here. I mean, yes, I founded Greenpeace and I wanted to engage in, in, in environmental conservation, but the corporates have taken it over and they are now busy making money out of it. That was his position. And uh, yet, when he says a thing like that, very few mainstream media outlets will highlight it. But in the interest of time, I will go, because I love to make moderators very happy usually, I am going to go to the, the human and the non-human, a new perspective. And I see here that my slides got messed up, but there we are. Conservation, I, now the Luo of Kenya live in the western part of the country. They are an ilotic people, they are not Bantus. And I am grounded in that culture. So I want to share a few things about that culture. One, conservation of animals. They consider it to be, we, because I'm in the community, we consider it to be a moral duty. Killing of animals for sport is forbidden. They must only be killed for food or in self-defense. But the idea that came from the West, like the, the way one of the uh, Western uh, American presidents, uh, was it, um, I've just forgotten his name, he came here in the 1930s in Kenya, to Kenya, to just hunt and kill our animals for fun. That is sacrilegious. How do you just kill animals to have fun and carry away the head of a lion? Uh, we think that that is, that is less than juvenile. It is cruel. Secondly, toads are to be removed from houses but not killed. Children are told that if they kill them, their mother's breasts will fall off. Why kill a toad? Just send it out of your house, but don't kill it. And third, the story of a frog that saved a group of girls from the jaws of a hyena. The girls had gone, the hyena had pretended to be a good husband, a bride went along with him, and uh, her, her girl age mates, her, her, her age mates, girls, her age mates exported her, but at night the hyena was about to devour them. They, uh, the, the girls, the girls uh, got wind of it from a disabled girl who woke the others up, much as they didn't even want her to accompany them. And they ran off. And when the hyena was about to catch them, they were at the river and the river swallowed all of them and spewed them across the river the other side and they escaped. Now, that kind of story is to ensure that frogs become, are endeared to the children so that they don't harm. And then the eating of doves, forbidden because they breed very slowly. So they do eat a lot of birds, the weaver birds and a few other grain eating birds, but they'll tell you don't eat the dove. And it's because it breeds very slowly. And so the Lu are very conscious of conservation. But now I want to look at the human life where human life is valued above animal life. That is the Luo position. I know we've been told in this conference that Africans, oh, they see, you know, animals as planet mates and they are very nice to them. But I want to give a few reasons, a few indicators that in Luo thought, human life is valued above animal life. One, the ontological hierarchy that is spoken a lot about is uh, it was presented uh, in the Bantu context. God, ancestors, recently departed, John Mbiti calls them the living dead, then the living humans, animals, plants, non-living things. That's a hierarchy. And it is true that this hierarchy exists. I mean, secondly, animal sacrifice in place of human sacrifice tells us that humans are considered to be of more value than animals. That's why 
animals are killed in place of humans. And thirdly, animals for bride wealth is not a compensation. Human life is much more valuable than countless animals. So among the Luo, whenever we meet our brothers-in-law, we tell them, you owe me and you can never fully pay. The cows you brought cannot have the same value as our sister whom we gave to you to wife. So you will always owe me, and whenever we meet, you need to pay a little more, and you will never complete the pay, because a human being is infinitely much more valuable than any number of cows you can bring. So we just give you the girl as a gift. She is too precious to be compared to the few animals you bring. Fourthly, no funeral rites for animals. If they were of, same, of the same value, there would be funeral, funeral rites for them. And fifth, no belief in the afterlife for animals. And there is more where that came from. No, no genealogies of animals. There is no record that this cow begat this other one. And seven, no veneration for dead animals akin to veneration for the living dead and the long departed. Those are highly respected, but we never hear about, oh, there was a cow that was here a few years ago, and oh, let us give it a bit of libation. There's nothing like that. And the eighth one, insults. Human beings insult each other in low community by saying you're a cow, you're a dog. That again shows that when you are called a cow or a dog, you are being demeaned. And ninthly, animals do not have personhood, as described by Ifeani Menkiti and others. I do not know of any suggestion of personhood uh, of animals in the Luo community. And so I want to get to my conclusion. My conclusion is rather lengthy, but I will do it very fast, very fast. The first point I want to, me, to make here is the need for authenticity in African philosophy. In African religions, in Western scholarship, Okot Pabitek um, lamented that Western scholarship on African religions imposes Western concepts on African religions. If there is a supreme God, in, a, in the West, there must be here, you see? Secondly, in African philosophy, myth, and reali reality, Pauline J. Huntonji protested that um, ethnophilosophy is so amorphous that any scholar can attribute his or her own thoughts to African worldviews. He says, you know, um, temples can say that Africans have um, uh, vital power, they believe in vital power, another scholar can disagree, there is no way to settle the quote. And then, and the third point, in decolonizing African philosophy and religion, Kwasi Wiredu advised that to determine the authenticity of a concept claimed to be African, it should be translatable into a language on the continent. And so, I go to my proposed solutions. What is the solution out of this? What are, what are the proposed remedies? First, there is need to further refine the notion of African philosophy, to refrain from conflating African worldviews with African philosophy, because it is racist. In the sense that when you discuss Kant or you discuss John Stuart Mill, you don't say you are discussing European philosophy. You are just discussing Mill or Kant. Why is it that people with such great ease conflate African worldviews with African philosophy, critique of culture, critique of politics, and so on? That really does need to stop. Second, the study of the human and the non-human is crucial. But the terms human animals and non-human animals are imports to the continent. They do not make sense in the African worldviews I know, and I will be explaining it shortly. Third, 
Following Kwasi Wiredu, there is need to distinguish philosophy as critical discourse from philosophy as ideology. Right now, that distinction is becoming very vague because philosophers have embraced discourses of the United Nations and are now articulating them rather than interrogating them. The fourth point here is ultimately the decolonization of philosophy in Africa will involve a much greater readiness to hold and express highly divergent, even controversial views to challenge dominant Western-driven narratives. Fifth, applying I am because we are to animals is a misrepresentation of Mbiti's sound representation of kinship. And in fact, even applying Ubuntu to animals is dissonant in the sense that Africans make a distinction between humans and animals. Kai Kresse, in his book, Philosophizing in Mombasa, or the second, the second one, has pointed out that there is Utu and Unyama. Utu is humanness, and, and Unyama is uh, being, I, I wanted to say bestiality, but that can mean something totally different, but has to do with when one behaves like an animal, we say, unyama. that is be behaving like an animal, because there is that contrast between the human and the animal. I'm just about done. There is urgent need to refrain from superimposing contemporary globalized conservationist ideology onto thought systems and worldviews of the peoples of Africa. Seventh, following Wiredu's advice to translate concepts claimed to be African into indigenous languages, I have tried to translate the key words of this conference into my mother tongue, Doluo, and here are the results. Le Mokdano meaning non-human animal. This is tautological because animal refers to a, uh, I, I meant to say here, le mokdano, non-human animal. This is tautological because animal refers to a human, a, a non-human living, a, a, it should have been a living thing, remove that human there. That was an error. It refers to a living thing which is not a plant, which is not a plant. So if you have an animal, it is a living thing which is not a human being and it is not a plant. That is an animal. It is not a living thing. Uh, sorry, it's not a plant. It is not a human being. Therefore, it is a, an animal. Okay? That is how the Lua would see that. So the idea of a non-human animal does not make sense in the linguistic scheme of the law. Secondly, dano ma le, a human animal. Help! What a kind of, what kind of thing is that? We would use that phrase when a person has behaved antisocially. Maybe you raped, when a person has raped a child or something. We say that one is a human animal. And so I, I, I come to a conclusion, and it is this. The title of this conference is The Non-Human Animal in African Philosophy, a Reconfiguration of Humanity and the Non-Human from an African Perspective. The title presumes at least two points that themselves de deserve serious debate. A, that the human and the non-human require a reconfiguration. B, that the African perspective, whatever that is, is amenable to the reconfiguration of the human and the non-human in line with the current dominant globalist conservationist discourse. To proceed as though these two points were self-evident is to impose a contemporary Western-driven corporatized conservationist narrative onto a whole continent with its hundreds of diverse cultures and is in fact the continuation of Western imperialist epistemicide in the neocolonial era. If this is a bit hard, 
I apologize and thank you for your attention.